I want to take, thank uh, Torsten and Tony for inviting me uh, here to give this talk. Um, it's the work of quite a few people, as you can see, um, and also involves both theory and experiment in ways that would take a very long time to describe completely. So uh, what I will do is give you the basics of the work that we've done, and I look forward to talking to any of you afterwards about some of the details. Um, it's also interesting that it comes after the prior two talks. Um, I have an answer for Dave Waba about optical activity of isotropic materials, and it's blue phase. That's your competition. Check out the blue phase, which is also interesting because um, much of the work you heard from Lecht uh, follows the work that was done on blue phases uh, uh, quite a while ago. So it's a, it's a nice, uh, nice way to keep these talks going together. And the final thing is that uh, I'm going to be showing you a new system, a system where the ordering uh, entities are supermolecular structures in a solvent. And I want to tell you that there is a lot out there to be learned. The helical filament phase can be swelled. There are lots of discotic liquid crystal phases that can be swelled with a solvent. And in fact, what you'll be seeing here are supermolecular assemblies where the solvent is water. Uh, there's been work in this area. I think there's a wide open uh, avenue for discovery there. So the materials I'm going to tell you about are chromonic liquid crystals. Um, the two examples on the screen, one uh, sunset yellow is a common food dye um, outlawed in uh, Europe in our food in America, but I think outlawed soon. Uh, <laughs> sodium uh, chromoglycate is a fairly old asthma drug. When these materials, and there's many like these, uh, are put in water, um, they self-assemble uh, into a stack. The stack is anisotropic, and at high enough concentrations and low enough temperatures, these uh, aggregates, these assemblies, will order into a liquid crystal phase. Typically, um, as you can see on the slide, uh, there's an isotropic phase, N is a nematic phase, C is a columnar phase, uh, in which the uh, stacks actually form uh, a two-dimensional hexag hexagonal lattice. Uh, also notice that there are large two-phase regions in between this. So we're going to be talking about a system where the ordering unit is an assembly. Um, and it's also an aqueous system. And I think these are going to be very important because of the implications they have for biology and medicine. So we're going to be talking about sunset yellow as an example of uh, a chromonic liquid crystal. Now, there's been work recently. A lot of the work is being done here under, uh, with Oleg's group uh, into chromonics. Uh, it's like we're doing thermotropic liquid crystals back in the 1970s, in fact, finding out about these things. Uh, one is the measurement of the elastic constants. So I think most of you know that the three most common uh, elastic constants, play, twist, and bend, have been measured for thermotropics. As you can see from the top line of the chart for 5CB, uh, the elastic constants are more or less the same. And many theoretical uh, investigations use one value for all three of the elastic constants. But we find out for uh, chromatic liquid crystals that is not true. The twist elastic constant is roughly an order of magnitude less than the other two. Um, and we've had lots of fun, a bunch of groups have had lots of funds, fun showing that when you constrain a uh, chromonic liquid crystal so it must be distorted, it will find a way to twist above any other deformation because twist is so cheap. And so there's been many uh, experiments where we get new structures because these things will twist when thermotropic liquid crystals would somehow divide it up between uh, bend, splay, and twist. Um, and there's one other term that has a rich history in a free energy. Uh, it's called the saddle splay term. It's a volume distortion term, um, which means it comes from 
certain curvatures in the bulk of the liquid crystal, whatever the director is doing, but it happens to be a divergence and therefore can be calculated um, by doing a surface integral instead of a volume integral. This is simply an equality that comes from the mathematics, sort of like Gauss's theorem of uh, electrostatics, but it's really a, a, a bulk term. Um, but it means that whatever is happening on the surface can interfere with measurements of K24. And there's a rich history in uh, uh, thermotropic liquid crystals, but uh, we ran into a case where we had to ask some of the same questions about uh, chromonic liquid crystals. So if you want to know anything about K24 in thermotropics, uh, one of the pioneers, Dave Allender, is here. Please ask him the questions. Don't ask me. Um, but let me give you a quick rundown um, about the work that was done. Uh, I mentioned that it integrates to the boundary and kind of serves, uh, you can think of it as acting like a boundary condition where the director favors alignment along the direction of highest curvature if K24 is greater than zero. Um, the saddle splay term is constant if the director is held perpendicular to the surface. So in those conditions where you have homeotropic boundary conditions, it doesn't enter because the bulk configuration doesn't change the surface term, therefore, the K24 integral doesn't change. Um, surface interactions uh, can uh, impose boundary conditions that make it difficult to disentangle surface boundary conditions from K24. And uh, over the work, time of this work, there were some inequalities between K24 and K2 and K1 called the Erickson, Erickson inequalities. They apply if the spatially, if the spatially uniform, if gradients are spatially uniform. Um, in our case, that is not true. So in fact, we are not bound by these inequalities. Measured values for K24 vary quite a bit in thermotropics. They are on the order of, of the K1, K2, and K3. Um, this is some of the results from that period on uh, work on thermotropics. And so it's a graph showing that uh, the different axes, uh, uh, one is W and anchoring strength at the surface. Uh, there's actually two anchoring strengths in K24. But you see the kind of configurations you can get in a cylindrical capillary. On the lower left is the a uh, planar axial field where the, um, the director is parallel to the surface but along the axis. Uh, upper left is the escaped uh, twisted one where the, the angle of the director on the surface is uh, not along either the principal uh, directions of curvature. Um, and then there is the PB planar bipolar where the director is always going around in the actual direction. And so this work was done if, with the assumption that you had uh, degenerate planar boundary conditions where the director wanted to be parallel to the surface but not in any direction. And as you change K24, different things happened. Um, the assumption was that the elastic constants were equal that's not true for chromonics, we had to start again. So the theoretical people in this effort simply started the calculation again. And there you see kind of the, uh, the capillary and uh, the, uh, the way uh, variables were assigned to describe it. Um, it's basically cylindrical uh, um, uh, coordinates. And the idea was to put this together and minimize the free energy um, uh, with the boundary conditions appropriate to degenerate planar. Uh, beta 2, which is one of the variables used to describe the orientation of the director, um, at the surface is called beta 1. So it's really uh, the angle that the uh, director makes with the axis uh, along the surface. And so you minimize the frank uh, free energy with these boundary conditions. The first thing you find out is the K24 term. So it's written there as K24 over pi L. That's really per unit length. Um, 
is a number times the sine squared of beta 1. It looks very much like a anchoring strength type of uh, a boundary condition where something wants to align perpendicular or parallel to a certain direction. And that's the problem. It looks like a boundary uh, effect. Uh, but if you do the calculation, you find out that when K24 is less than 2 times K2, you get the parallel axial, axial configuration. But when K24 is greater than 2K2, uh, you get the escaped uh, twisted configuration. And you can even write down how beta depends on R, starting at 0 and going to some maximum beta 1 as you uh, go out an R. And notice that R scales with large R, the radius of the capillary. So really, the size of the capillary is not uh, as important as you might think it would be. Uh, this kind of shows you how the theory, what the theory predicts in our case. If you look at the graph, the blue dot is uh, on the uh, horizontal axis where the chromonic uh, uh, elastic constants say it should be. And so we're going to just increase uh, K2 and go vertically from there. And what you see as you increase, you cross over from the para paraaxial, parallel axial one, which is the white portion of the phase diagram. And as you increase it, you see the twisting coming in. And when you get high enough K24, it twists almost by 90 degrees when it gets to the surface. OK, so that's what we expected going in. Is there any evidence that's what really what happens? Um, we looked at this optically, and we simply said, let's put polarized light on the capillary. Um, what we do is then do a Jones matrix calculation where you divide all your capillary volume into little voxels, and you know what the director is doing there if it's escaped, uh, if it's escaped twisted, and you kind of put in the escape twisted uh, configuration, and you do the calculation. And so uh, with polarized light, cross polarizers, and we did it for sunset yellow. Um, and you get the experimental uh, picture, which is the top one, and then the simulation from the Jones calculus below. And as you can see, for cross polarizers at 45 degrees or um, at 0 and 90 degrees, uh, you get good comparison between the simulation using the twisted escape structure. Uh, what's interesting about this is to get the uh, good agreement that you have to make beta 1 equal to 90 degrees. The twist is very close to 90 degrees. Um, there's another way that we uh, tried to look at this, and this is using flickering experiments where you actually make a movie. Uh, we have a microscope with a very small depth of focus. And you can uh, move the focus up and down in the capillary. And you just look at the flickering. And so this I'm showing you here the flickering uh, above the center of the capillary and below the uh, center of the capillary. And you can see that the flickering has a direction associated with it. And these are in opposite directions because the twist is different. Um, you can see that it gets different as you go to the edge of the capillary. Um, so we looked only at the center, took a very small part of the center, took a movie, added up all the frames, found the average, subtracted the average. So we're only looking at the deviations from the average. You can take a Fourier transform of that, and you get a nice uh, elliptical type structure that gives you the direction of the fluctuations. And you can do this as you scan up and down in the capillary. And when you do that, you get a graph of what the twist angle is from the center of the capillary, where it's along the axis, or 0, up to very close to the, uh, um, the radius. And you see that um, with the proper values for some of the elastic constants, um, there's really only two independent vari variables in this twist, in, in this fit. Uh, you can get um, a, a function that very much mirrors the data. So that's a second confirmation that we do have this escaped, um, uh, twisted escaped uh, um, type of uh, configuration. Um, and this can be averaged over five different experiments on five different capillaries. And what you get there is that K24 over K3 um, is about 6.6. .6. Uh, 
uh, I'm wondering if that is, should be K2. Uh, actually, now that might be a mistake. Let's, we'll go back and see on that. But we actually get a value for uh, K24. Um, it has a large range, so you can see the average is 6.6, .6, but it really has a, a, an uncertainty from 3.8 to 9.4, and that has to do with the fitting of this. Um, there are also interesting defects between uh, the escaped region. It can escape to the left, it can escape to the right, and there are defects in between. You can imagine the escaping direction being different, uh, meeting in two ways. One where it just untwists and then twists up the other way. That's the bottom picture on this graph. Um, or it could actually have a hedgehog type of uh, defect, which is the top picture. And again, the theoretical people in the group actually calculated the energy of these defects. And, what they, and they could do it in two ways. They could make some simplifying uh, uh, assumptions and do it analytically. Those are the dotted lines. Or they could actually do a numerical um, uh, integration, uh, and which use the structure exactly. And what you see is that when K24 gets large enough, to the right uh, on the graph, the, the red curve, which is the energy with the defect, is always lower. And so with our value of uh, K24 over K of about 6, we expect always to see um, the hedgehog. And that's all we did see. We never did see um, the uh, sort of uh, uh, planar type of uh, um, uh, defect in these systems. So that's another reason to think that this value we're getting is on target. Um, we also check the defect using Jones matrices again, actually calculating what the hedgehog defect would look like under cross polarizers. And again, you see the experiment on the top and the Jones matrix simulation on the bottom. And you can see there's very nice correspondence there. So. Um, that's the, uh, the end of our work at this point. Um, we're, we've made what we think is the first uh, measurement of the saddle display elastic constant in a chromonic liquid crystal. Um, it is large. It's, not, it's more like the splay and bend uh, elastic constant than the twist elastic constant. And we've seen some new uh, chiral uh, defects in these structures that we think we understand. And so uh, there are the list of the characters. Um, uh, top two on the left, uh, Zoe and Lewis. They're the students who did most of the work. Uh, the next two on the top are two postdocs. And the old guys are in the bottom low, long below. So I hope I've stayed within my time, and I'm ready to answer any questions. Thank you. Maybe only one question, <laughs> because after this, we have a coffee break, mm -hmm. yeah, whatever you can do. Like, well, okay. so maybe two. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I've got two, so. <laughs> <laughs> Three. Okay. The same time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there should be at least two types of point defects, and your first uh, slide actually showed two different types of uh, textures in the same capillary. Presumably, they would correspond to two types of point defects. So are they really two different types or, or not? This is my first question. Uh, two, two different defects, uh, point defects, meaning like hyperbolic versus radial? Not exactly, but similar. Similar to that. that. Um, I, will have to, I would have to go back and look at many of the pictures. And on the sides, it's something totally different. OK, this is, this is really embarrassing since one of the students put that up there for artistic purposes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even say if the boundary there conditions. Might be some yeah, that, uh, that, that could easily have come from work um, having to do with the <laughs> perpendicular boundary conditions. I can't be sure at this point. And the second question is about boundary conditions. So in the old articles uh, by Nabarro, they uh, mentioned that if they purchase commercial available capillaries uh, that are not treated as presumably give the, uh, you know, degenerate boundary conditions, what they get, in fact, uh, is um, azimuthal type of anchoring or mm -hmm. circular, so preset 
Yeah, uh, let me see if I can get there quickly. Because uh, I have a slide for that. Yeah. And I don't know if I can get this to display again, but this will be good enough. You can see uh, what's up there. Um, we looked at the capillaries um, with AFM and uh, SEM to see if there was any roughness or anything at all on the capillaries that might contribute to a boundary condition type of alignment. Um, and as you can see, uh, uh, we could not see anything in SEM at all on the surface, and the AFM gave us a very small, on the order of one nanometer roughness. So in trying to be a little bit um, uh, numer you know, numerical about that, um, what we did was go back to the theory, and you can see that the important parameter is the value of K24 versus R times the anchoring strength. That's, those are the two competing coefficients. Well, we do know we can get anchoring um, if you rub and put grooves in the glass. And so uh, what we did was estimate uh, what K24 is from our measurements, which is about 50 piconewtons. And then we went back to the roughness slide, you know, where we actually put grooves in there, measured the roughness to be about 27 nanometers on average, okay? And that makes R omega, uh, RW, because we measured the anchoring strength with those grooves, to be about 20 piconewtons. So that's with a very rough surface uh, that we know produces alignment. Our surface had a surface roughness, you know, of 30 times less. And so we still think we're in a regime where the surface conditions, at least roughness, are not producing something that uh, uh, actually competes with it. Okay, so all I can repeat is <laughs> same question with the second. No, well, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll save it for the discussion. Okay, <laughs> this is good. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much.